Well, good morning, good morning. Good morning, hello to you all. I know it's morning for some, just like me, on June 2nd, but I also know people are coming, tuning in from different places around the world. It could be afternoon or evening. So in any case, I welcome you all and thank you for taking time out of your day to join me. Let me do a quick check of the audio and video to make sure things are good to go. Looks like we're good to go. If you want to give me a thumbs up that you can see me well and hear me well on your end, I'd appreciate it. I see one member in the chat. I hope others will join in. If you want to become a member and join the live chat, look for the join button on your channel, okay? Or on the channel page. If you see the blue join button, go ahead and click it and you can join the chat today, okay? Um, but thank you everyone for watching and after the live stream, I'll be working on some follow-up tasks for my members. So if you'd like to gain some extra practice, then again, click the join button and it's one of the perks you can get for just a dollar a month. It's also a way to support my channel. Thank you to all the current members. I really appreciate the support. But we have about um, 30 to 60 minutes. I promise 30, I usually go closer to 60. So if you have the time to stay with me for the full 30 or 60 minutes, that would be great. Um, if you're watching the recording, then <laughs> you already know how long this live stream is going to be. Hey, I see Witfil there from Minsk, Belarus. Good to have you here. I was in Minsk a long time ago. Actually, I was there a couple times. I do have nice memories by the water. I do remember Minsk. <laughs> Okay, good to have a couple members with me. Um, we do have Q&A. Um, so members were invited to send some questions in advance. It's always an opportunity to get um, live answers, live explanations to questions that you have. I try to check comments daily and answer everyone's questions. But as a member, you, every month you can send in a question and I'll do my best to address it at the monthly live stream. Manuel is here. Good to have you. <laughs> Some familiar names, if not faces, but good to have you guys here. All right, so let me jump into sharing the screen. Let me work my magic, come over here and check to see that you see what I see. I'm gonna look at my laptop. Ma Hippo has just come in to the chat as well. Welcome, welcome from Japan. <laughs> Thank you for staying up late to join me. What time is the best time of the day, by the way, for you guys to study English? Do you feel like your mind works best at night or in the morning? I'm just curious. When I was studying, obviously in like high school, um, you had no choice. You have to go to school in the morning and then you either have language classes in the morning or afternoon. Typically they'd be in the morning. And I remember in college, my language classes were always in the morning for some reason, and I liked that. So I felt for me personally, the morning was a good time to learn a language and to go to class. But who knows, I mean, throughout the day is a good time, as long as you have time to focus without distractions. But I'm curious, you can let me know in the chat, what do you find to be the best time of day for you personally to really focus on your English studies? I'm curious. <laughs> You're looking at my mug. <laughs> Are you being humorous? Yes, I have a big mug today. It'll last at least an hour. My tea is nice and hot. It's two in the afternoon for Manuel. So hopefully afternoon is good for you. All right. As I said, guys, this is our live stream for June. If you'd like to join the chat, please click join and you can become a member. If you are an advanced learner of English, you are invited to go a step further and join me on Patreon as a lifelong learner. We have group classes on Patreon. Um, we have not started yet in June, so it's a great time to sign up. Um, our classes on Zoom are 75 minutes. That's a full hour of instruction and then 15 minutes for Q&A. 
day. Um, I offer pre and post lesson tasks, so there's plenty to keep you busy between classes. That's also a way to get practice and feedback from me. I share exclusive materials. As soon as you sign up on Patreon, you will have access to a lot of previously uploaded materials. Um, there's community interaction because the current group um, as a wonderful welcoming group so you can interact with people through the comments and of course when we meet on zoom all cameras all mics are on and as another perk when you're on patreon as a lifelong learner you do have private messaging with me so if you have a quick question throughout the week you can send it to me and i'm available <laughs> Okay. We focus on all skills, but my members on Patreon vote each month through a poll for a topic. Um, you do need to be advanced. B2 would be the minimum. Um, this month we voted and the winning topic was loads of listening. So I'll be designing tasks and um, opportunities to practice listening skills, listening for details, listening for overall comprehension, listening um, with the possibility of retelling what you just heard, and then also reacting through discussion. We'll be meeting twice in June, um, June 9th and June 23rd. The times have yet to be confirmed, but I'm pretty certain June 9th will be at 9 o'clock a.m. this time. Um, and then June 23rd, the group has yet to vote. Okay, so think about those opportunities to really go beyond my videos. Another uh, opportunity I've told you about in the past, I'll remind you again, is that um, LinkQ is a site um, created by the Polyglot. Uh, you'll recognize him from the interviews we've done together. And I have an affiliate link. You can sign up um, on LinkQ. I even have a, a small course on movie reviews if you'd like to take. So I'll share um, these links in the chat or in the description um, towards the end. Okay. All right, let's get moving. And I have a question for you. Have you watched the six recent shorts? Um, I decided not to upload one long video recently, but instead I uploaded six shorts. Those are the one minute videos to address all the words, the compound words that end with ever, whatever, however, whenever, etc. Um, so if you haven't, please do. But what I'd like to do now is do a quick review of those words. Somebody had asked asked me in the past to address this group of words and it was a very good request because I hadn't um, done so up until now. So let's take a moment and jump over to um, this group of questions that I've prepared. We'll be choosing the correct word in this exercise, whatever, whoever, whichever, wherever, whenever, and however, okay? Note with pronunciation, when I say this word, I flap my T. That's typical of American English. Instead of whatever, I say whatever. It sounds like a D, okay? Yes, Manmo, TBD, to be decided, or to be confirmed. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go in. All right, so tell me what sounds most natural that's interesting. That is. And the person responds, it's a flower. Don't you see the petals? Maybe the person looked at this art and didn't immediately recognize. Oh, that's interesting. What fits? I know there's a bit of a delay on your end, so I'll wait for you guys to catch up. Yes. Mm -hmm. When we're not certain what something is, whatever is an appropriate choice. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Whatever that is. And listen to my intonation, whatever that is. So I'm going up and then down. My stress is on that, right? That's interesting. Whatever that is. Oh, it's a flower. Don't you see the petals? Okay. Two. Let's offer refreshments to, hmm. Let's offer refreshments. Refreshments are things to drink, to refresh, right? Like beverages, cold beverages usually. Refreshments could be tea or coffee, but I usually think of cold beverages. Let's offer refreshments to
Mm. Um, and that previous uh, item, though, Manuel, I would stick with what, because your main question would be, what is that? You wouldn't say, which is that? You'd say, what is that? Well, whatever that is, it's interesting. Okay. Yes, Mahippo also got the answer correct. Let's offer refreshments to whoever's here. Why whoever's with that apostrophe S? Why does that work? Well, think about why I'm using let's with apostrophe S here. Let's is a contraction. Let us. We say let's. Whoever is also a contraction here. Whoever is, right? I could say let's offer refreshments to whoever is here. But in everyday English, I would definitely use a contraction. Let's offer refreshments to, ho to whoever's here, whoever's, whoever's. Ah, good idea. Okay. <laughs> Manuel, you're watching your budget? Yes. Well, if it's a party, though, and you're the host, you would hopefully have things prepared, and you wouldn't charge your guests when you serve them refreshments. Look at this. I found this picture. I remember visiting the beach and um, in Ocean City, Maryland, my grandparents would frequently take us there. And when we'd walk the boardwalk at night, um, the boardwalk was like this basic, kind of like a sidewalk, but not concrete. It's made of boards, hence boardwalk. And as you walk along the boardwalk, sometimes there would be all artists like sculpture like they would do sand sculptures and some people were so very talented it was really beautiful to watch their work and um, as it got dark and the sun went down they would have lights set up so you could really appreciate um, what they created that day so wow hmm made that sand sculpture is really talented have you ever seen anything like that I'm always amazed that they do that. They, they spray water to help hold the sand together, but still, um, it's such a fragile piece of artwork. Um, but it's really amazing what they can do. Yes, Mahippo. Wow, whoever made that sand sculpture is really talented, right? Why are we using whoever? Because we're saying, I don't know who it is. It could be practically anyone, but whoever it is, I don't know. Um, I don't care where the person's from, what age, what background, but wow, that person is really talented, whoever it is. I'm opening the possibility to everyone, anyone, whoever this artist is, that person is very talented, okay? So we can use whoever when we don't know exactly who that person could be. Okay, how about this situation? You can borrow a hmm shirt you want. Thanks, I think I'll take the red one. Right, the person's thinking, oh, it doesn't matter to me. You can choose this one, this one. Regardless of your choice, it's all okay. No matter what you choose, it's all okay. That's the meaning of these words. When we take the question word and add ever, it has often the meaning implies no matter what or regardless. It's all okay. Either it's all okay or the outcome is the same. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Um, and well, in your sentence, I might say, um, whatever they, people think, it doesn't matter. I still think that whoever made that sculpture is really talented. Like, maybe somebody disagrees with me, but doesn't matter. Whatever they say, it's not going to change my opinion that that artist is very talented. Oh, you're saying where you live too. Mm, you have um, artists who make beautiful sculptures from sand. Yes, in this one you could. So let's stick though with whatever. Sometimes there is an overlap with whichever and whatever. Um, and there really isn't too much of a meaning difference. Um, I would say that which 
works here because it's a small group or especially if there's like only two choices oh whichever one doesn't matter to me whatever really opens the door and you say you can borrow whatever shirt you want in which case maybe the person sees a fifth option behind these in the closet and say oh what about that one the purple one oh yeah that's fine whatever which, whichever shirt from these ones that you see. So which is usually from a specific group, whatever opens the door to any and all possibilities. But again, the person is saying any choice you make is okay. You can borrow whatever shirt you want. Thanks. I think I'll take the red one. Mm -hmm. Yes, Manuel, whichever, whatever works here. They can sometimes overlap in that case. Uh, but in that previous one, right, when we said um, uh, whatever that is, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. I wouldn't say whichever, right? Whatever that is, I don't know the name of it, but whatever that is, wow, that's interesting. All right, number five, let's share an appetizer. Do you want nachos or chicken wings? The person is very flexible and says order you like. Both sound good. Remember what I just said. There's a choice here, a limited choice, two options. Choose the one you like. The choice you make, any choice you make, either choice you make is fine. No matter what you choose or regardless, everything will be fine with me. Yes, whichever. Here, you could possibly say order whatever, but again, which is more for that limited choice of options? I would definitely favor whichever here. Do you feel the difference? Right? There's two options, nachos or chicken wings. Order whichever one. I don't care. Order whichever one you like. Or if I say order whatever you want, I'm like, oh, well, does it have to be nachos? Can we order something else to share? Right? Maybe shrimp cocktail? <laughs> like, sure. But if we're referring to these two options, I think which makes more sense. You want both? <laughs> yeah. I know. Chicken wings are really popular here in the U.S., especially on the menu um, when you look at appetizers for American, um, at American restaurants. But I find there's so little meat on the wings. <laughs> I personally would prefer the nachos with lots of vegetables cut up like that. Order whichever one you like. Okay order whichever one. A few more. Which island did Chad and Priya choose for their vacation? I can't remember, but hmm, they are. I'm sure they're having a fabulous time. This one should be somewhat easy because we're talking about place. Isn't that a beautiful place that you see? Would you want to vacation there? <laughs> Yes, it's true, Manuel. Sometimes people, I've done this, I've ordered things off the appetizer menu, and that's my meal. I don't want a bigger thing. I just want one or two appetizers, and sometimes that's enough, like a soup and um, chicken wings or a soup and, I don't know, something else, potato skins, I don't know. But appetizers can be very filling, especially if you're not sharing. If you order an appetizer just for yourself, that's usually a very good portion for one person. <laughs> okay, what's the answer for six? I agree. I can't get over that blue. Have you ever seen water that blue? How amazing, huh? So which island did Chad and Priya choose for their vacation? Oh, I, I can't remember, but wherever they are, I'm sure they're having a fabulous time because they're, you know, positive people. They like to travel. So wherever they go, wherever they are, they have a good time. They always can have a good time wherever they are wherever. Mm -hmm. Note the spelling, right? We don't double the E right here. It's where, and then we have a single E before VR, wherever. All right. Moving ahead, we have a total of 10, so we'll get up to number seven. Imagine you're driving, okay? And then your passenger says, oh, that other driver just gave you an angry look. And you're like, ugh, 
I didn't do anything wrong. What word do we use for that feeling of like, you know, I don't care, or it doesn't bother me. This feeling of indifference, which word expresses indifference? Yes, it was a lovely location, number six. Probably don't have a very good Wi-Fi signal there, huh? <laughs> it's the kind of place where you unplug. That other driver just gave you an angry look and maybe also an angry gesture, you know, and you're like, oh, I didn't do anything wrong, you know. You don't let that angry person bother you. Yes. Okay. Whatever. And notice how you say it because you're like, oh, I don't care. So whatever, whatever. I didn't do anything wrong. When you don't care, when you're not going to let something bother you, whatever. I didn't do anything wrong. Be careful with this word. It also could be very rude. Um, if you say it in a certain situation, your listener can totally be offended because you're saying whatever they are saying or thinking doesn't matter. So you're maybe someone's trying to give you um, advice and you don't want the advice and whatever. It means I don't care what you're saying. I'm not listening. I'm not going to pay attention to what you're saying. So uh, again, it expresses indifference. In a situation where people are angry with you and they're saying angry words, you can think whatever. And that's healthy that you're not going to let negative words bother you. But in another situation, if people are trying to give you helpful information and you're tuning them out, you don't want to listen, um, you don't value what they're saying, whatever can be very offensive. Like, I don't care what you say. Nothing you say matters to me. So be careful with this word. Okay. Eight. Mm -hmm. Imagine this child earlier was crying, um, acting out. The, the, this little child wouldn't go to sleep. And it's always difficult every day to get this child to fall asleep and take a nap. And so um, one person, maybe a relative uh, neighbor came over and decided to help out. And so the parent is thinking, oh, oh my gosh, you got her to sleep. Hmm, did you get her to fall asleep? And I was, oh, it wasn't difficult. I sang a few songs and that put her to sleep. The person is surprised. So which word helps us express surprise over the manner in which something was accomplished, the manner in which something was done? Yes, in response to whatever, you could do whatever with a period or whatever with an exclamation point. It depends, okay, on the emotion behind it. And number eight, I agree. You could simply ask, gosh, how did you get her to fall asleep? And with your voice, you can express surprise without the use of the ever ending. But however is used for emphasis here. However did you get her to fall asleep? Wow. I can't get her to fall asleep that fast, that easily. However did you do it? And again, you could simply use how. How did you do that? How did you manage? However did you get her to fall asleep? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perhaps you remember, uh, or parents to or grandparents told you stories of how they tried to get you to fall asleep as a little kid. Maybe you didn't want to take your afternoon nap. Okay, two more. How often does Uma go surfing? Hmm, possible. It's her passion. What answers the question, how often? Again, we're using this ever ending to emphasize many possibilities. Many possibilities. I've never tried surfing, by the way, have you? <laughs> How often does Uma go surfing? Oh, like all the time, in any time. Yes, my hippo. Whenever possible, 
It's her passion. Whenever she can find time, she goes. Whenever it's convenient, whenever the weather and the water is good, she goes. And so whenever is emphasizing at any time possible, whenever, oh, whenever possible, is there something that you love so passionately that you'll do it whenever possible? Think about that. I might pose that question to members now and also later in the follow-up task. What do you love like Uma? Is there something you love so passionately that you'll do it whenever possible? Last one. Are you working on your new story? Yeah, but hmm, hard I try. I just can't seem to find the right ending. The person's working and working and regardless of the effort, no matter what effort this push person puts into this story, um, the person says, I can't seem to find the right ending. Regardless of the effort I put in, no matter the effort, I don't want to say another word to give you the hint. <laughs> Well, you know, it depends where the person lives, right? If they're in a place where the temperature is pretty mild, maybe they can surf year-round. Um, there could be beaches that are good for surfing year-round. I imagine Hawaii might be an option. Um, I only visited Hawaii in the summertime, but, and I'm not much into surfing to know. But actually, serious surfers probably know um, year-round which beaches are the best places for surfing. So they probably save up their money to travel and go to the right places at the right time, right? So they can surf um, and have the best experiences year-round. Yes, right? However hard I try, however hard I try, I just can't seem to find the right ending. I try and try, and no matter how hard I try, regardless of how hard I try, however hard I try. So there's different ways to say this. Um, I think regardless is not so everyday conversational, um, but you know, no matter how hard I try would be fine too. However hard I try, I just can't seem to find the right ending. So please, if you haven't already, um, check out, let me go back here, um, the six recent shorts. Um, if, you wanna, if you're a teacher, by the way, and you want to go through this exercise with students, um, I saved those slides, and you can use them as well um, in a, a lesson. Feel free to. But please review those six shorts. Um, if you want to make further examples, you can watch the shorts and then put examples in the comments, okay? Very group, a very useful group of words. All right, let's move on. Um, if you have any new questions, members, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll do my best. Oh, inversion. Is that one of your questions? <laughs> However hard. What, are you asking or, or about a previous item, Manuel, or are you putting in a request? I'm wondering. I'll let you clarify. Um, one question did come in, so I wanted to address it um, in a number of ways. So we'll start with that. Um, and well, I'll wait. If, if you do have a question about inversion, um, type it again and I'll do my best to address that. But let's jump into this one. Um, there's a question about adjective clauses or relative clauses. I do get this question fairly often. Um, <laughs> it's not very nice, is it, that sometimes we have um, more than one way to call a certain grammar structure. Are adjective clauses and relative, relative clauses the same thing? the same thing? The answer is yes. <laughs> okay, they are the same thing. Um, now, in general, we use these adjective or relative clauses to identify or give more information about a noun or noun phrase. We're identifying someone or something with more information. And in contrast, where usually these one word adjectives go before a noun, like a smart man, um, a talented woman. So we put adjectives before a noun with adjective clauses or relative clauses. They follow the noun that they're modifying. So always remember that with word order, okay? However hard I try. Um, yeah, invert. I see what you're saying, Manuel. However hard I try. Yes, 
no matter how hard I try. It's it's similar to no matter, so therefore we put that at the in in the beginning of um, the the sentence. We don't say I try however hard, but however hard I try. We put those ever words at the beginning. Okay. All right. All right. So the first thing I want to point out is when we talk about adjective clauses or relative clauses. Um, we do then need the help of relative pronouns or adverbs. When I first made my playlist on this topic, I decided just to talk about um, pronouns, relative pronouns, and I grouped them all together just to be very simple. But the truth is there is a difference. Um, the pronouns replace a noun, right? They're, they hold it like he can be replace um, the name John and she can replace the name Anna. Um, it can replace an inanimate thing like a bug. So there are these relative pronouns that can be a subject or an object. We also have relative adverbs which include words like they look like question words like where, when, why. So in these first three sentences, let's identify the relative pronoun or adverbs, and we'll also identify the noun being modified. Um, this, <laughs> I know this is not the, the nicest topic, but I got inspired by real life because this is all true. I've been dealing with ticks lately, and if you don't know what a tick is, um, this is the picture of a tick. Where I live right now, there are plenty of ticks. It's the season for them to come out, unfortunately, and they're very little nasty bugs. A tick is a nasty little insect that sucks blood and carries Lyme disease. So they're not only like nasty and bothersome, but they could also make us sick, unfortunately. Um, perhaps you know. Okay. <laughs> A tick is a nasty little insect. That's my basic sentence, isn't it? A nasty little insect. Okay. okay, but what are we describing? What are we modifying? Insect. And now we're giving information about the insect. It's an insect that sucks blood and carries Lyme disease. Now we're giving information to identify the insect. This is identifying information because there are a lot of nasty little insects that we don't like um, seeing crawling in our homes or crawling on our arms, right? So we could possibly describe a number of insects. Some of them are beautiful, honestly, if you appreciate their anatomy. But um, there are others that I would really just categorize as nasty. A tick is a nasty little insect. Well, there's a few. Which one are you talking about? That one, the one that sucks blood and carries Lyme disease. Um, so that is a relative pronoun because it substitutes insect. It's an insect. The insect sucks blood. That sucks blood. So this relative pronoun replaces insect. And it's, an, it's a subject pronoun. It sucks blood. The insect sucks blood and carries Lyme disease. So again, we have our basic sentence. This is my main clause, my independent clause. A relative clause or an adjective clause is a dependent clause, meaning it cannot stand alone. We join it with the main clause and it becomes a complex sentence. This is identifying information. That's why I do not use a comma because I need this information to identify the insect. So all of this information is helping me identify the insect. It's an identifying um, adjective clause, an identifying relative clause. Okay. You guys are good. <laughs> How can we eliminate? Yes, that's you're getting you're you're following my thought process, Manuel. So first, let's look at these adjective clauses and remember um, what they do, how we make them, and then we'll also talk about reducing them briefly. Okay, I found some ticks on our home. True story, which isn't pleasant at all. It's not pleasant at all, and it's because we have a dog. I go walking with the dog, and sometimes we step into the wooded areas, and I'm, I'm sure that's how the dog gets ticks, and oh, I've gotten them too, so I have to be very careful walking around near the trees. I found some ticks in our home, which isn't pleasant at all. Okay. Yes, I agree with you guys, which 
is my next pronoun, and I have a comma now. So this is my main idea, my main clause. I found some ticks in our home. Which now is not referring to a single noun, but to the whole entire clause, um, adding information about this whole situation. So this is not an identifying clause. I'm adding information. And this information is like a comment on the entire situation that I just described. I found some ticks in her home. I could just say period, end. Now I'm adding my personal reaction, which isn't pleasant at all. So I use comma which because I'm adding information. It's not necessary. This is called non-identifying, non-identifying. I don't really need it. I'm just adding information and that's why I need a comma. If I'm not writing and speaking, you'll hear the pause with my voice and I often drop down in pitch. I found some ticks on her home, which isn't pleasant at all. Okay. Three, we live in a wooded area where ticks are common. In number three, I wouldn't reduce. I'm not. I wouldn't try to reduce here. But let's look for the main idea. We live in a wooded area. And now I want to identify this area. It's an area where ticks are common. I'm giving information about this place, this wooded area. And because it's a place, I'm using where. It's not a pronoun because, as you can see in this clause, ticks are common, subject verb. So relative pronouns could be a subject or object, but relative adverbs, um, they're adverbs. So I have subject, verb. This is a subject complement. And I'm basically saying ticks are common in that place. Ticks are common there, right? That's an adverbial. We live in a wooded area where ticks are common. Again, so this refers back to insect. This is a subject because we're saying it sucks blood. The insect sucks blood. Here, which is referring back to the entire idea. So which is a special pronoun that could refer back to one thing, but we could also use it to refer back to the entire statement, this whole situation. Here, wooded area is referring to a place. And it's not a pronoun, technically, um, because it's not a subject or an object. But I'm using this to give further information about the place. We live in a wooded area where ticks are common. Um, right, but in yours, um, stunning lad, what in the town near the sea, you're basically in the town, which is near the sea, you actually have a reduced clause in that beginning, in the town near the sea, the town, which is near the sea. I saw an elephant. Or that's the town where I saw an elephant. That's the town where I saw an elephant. There you have a relative clause. Okay, so again, adjective clauses and relative clauses are the same thing. It's just two names for the same thing. These clauses are dependent clauses. They follow the noun that they modify. Pronouns can be subjects or objects. And we need a comma if we're adding information, information that we could leave out and it would be fine. When information is necessary to identify that thing or that person, we do not use a comma. If we're talking about a place, we'd use a relative adverb. Again, you can watch my playlist to review all the relative adverbs, where, when, why. Right now, we're moving on to how we form these relative clauses. Another true story, I went um, to a park, a very small but pretty park this past weekend, and my um, younger brother and I sat there for a while and talked, and we watched geese. It was so peaceful. There were so many geese and a lot of baby geese. Um, so here are my sentences. Um, we have four sentences, and we're going to join them together. This is an exercise in showing how 
um, adjective or relative clauses help us form complex sentences instead of having two independent clauses or two separate sentences we're going to join them together and form a complex sentence if they f this way um, the ideas flow a bit a better and sometimes we can also reduce repetition here okay <laughs> okay I saw a group of geese the geese were enjoying the sunny day by the river it was a beautiful day. What day was that? Monday. Monday we went. Although I will tell you, goodness, right now, not only do we have ticks, and that's a problem right now, <laughs> but the pollen this year is really, really bad. The pollen comes from trees and plants, flowers. So the pollen is in the air, and anyone who has problems with allergies is really suffering this year. It's bad. I saw a group of geese. The geese were enjoying the sunny day by the river. So what we're going to do, again, just like we had the tick up here, that sucks blood. I don't need to make a separate sentence and say, it's a nasty little insect. This insect sucks blood. I took out the repetition and used a relative pronoun. We could do something similar here. Let's not repeat this. We just need a pronoun. When we talk about things, we have a choice of that or which. In an identifying clause, I'd say most American English speakers go with that. So here, I would stick in that. I saw a group of geese that were enjoying. Now technically, you, someone could say, wait, Jennifer, if, if it's group, you could say, I saw a group of geese that was enjoying, if they were enjoying it together. But I was thinking of all the individual geese, like all of them. So I'm going to go with uh, the plural were. I saw a group of geese that were enjoying the sunny day by the river. Okay. So it's not just any geese. I'm talking about the geese that were enjoying a sunny day by the river. Okay. Number five, then, true story, I watched a mom, and the mom, or the woman, encouraged her little boy to chase the geese. Very good, my hippo, I see you and I are on the same wavelength. Stunning lad one is jumping ahead here, yes. We don't need to repeat woman because woman and mom are the same, right? Right? Now we're talking about a person, so we have a choice. We can use who or we can use that. That is um, very flexible. We can use that to refer to things or people. But I like the choice of using who. Stunning lad one, I'll agree with you. And again, you can see both here and here, the relative pronouns are functioning as subjects. They were, she did this. They were enjoying, she encouraged. So we took out the subject and replaced it with a subject pronoun, a relative pronoun. We use that for the geese and we're using who for the mom. And so we've combined the sentences together and this is how we form complex sentences with adjective clauses. I watched the mom. Mm -hmm. And Manuel, notice, if I take this out, I watched a mom. You're like, okay, you watched a mom. Like, maybe there are a few moms there in the park. Which one did you watch? I want to identify her. And so I'm going to not put a comma in there because I consider this information important and necessary. I would only use a comma if it was extra. But I don't think the meaning is clear without this information. So I'm not going to use a comma. It's identifying information. I watched a mom who encouraged her little boy to chase the geese. Okay. So yeah, it's tricky with the commas. Just remember commas are like putting stuff to the side or in parentheses saying like, here's some extra information. Uh, you don't have to include it, but if you do, here it is. So commas are for extra information, additional information. If the information is necessary, then don't use a comma. 
Six, the mother and son laughed as the baby geese tried to run away. The running was part of the game. I'm using quotation marks around game because maybe they saw it as a game and I didn't. So we can use quotation marks around a word when you're um, questioning the meaning or you're using the word in a different way. It was part of their game. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to number six. We could just, you ask yourself, well, does it make sense without this information? The mother and son laughed as the baby geese tried to run away. Yes, it does make sense. So I do know whatever clause I put here, it's extra. It's similar, somewhat similar to number two up here, right? It's, it's what we're not referring to a single word, but an idea. And if we're referring to an idea, which is the best choice? Never use that after a comma. There's a rule. We, we follow that rule. We never do comma that. It's comma which. Okay, so please know that. The mother and son laughed as the baby geese tried to run away, which is part of the game. And when you're speaking, or whether it's a conversation or if you're reading, when you have that extra information, there's that pause. There's a pause, and then sometimes your voice drops down in pitch to again suggest that this is less important. It's extra information. Do we always use inside? Uh, yes, good question there. Mm -hmm. um, it varies, but in American English, yes. Um, I know, I think uh, it might be diff diff different rules in the UK, but we tend to put um, the period and the comma inside. Okay. I felt bad for the geese. They looked tormented by the child's play. Now, this is interesting. I felt bad for the geese. They refers to geese. Normally, we say who is reserved for people, not animals, but um, there, there's a gray area there. If you're really recognizing like their intelligence, their emotions, um, there could be a gray area where who works. And I see that's a suggestion here. Um, who, who looked tormented. I felt bad for the geese who looked tormented by the child's eye. Now, technically, I could also say, you could do who, um, you might argue for that. I felt bad for the geese that looked tormented. I felt bad for the geese who looked tormented. I don't recognize who um, as inappropriate because they're animals. I think both could actually work. I felt bad for the geese um, who looked tormented by the child's play. I felt bad for the geese that looked tormented by the child's play. I think both could work. I felt bad for the geese who that. I would accept both. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm tending to favor this one, that but I don't recognize who has a mistake here. It, I, I can see the argument for it. I felt bad for the geese that looked tormented by the child's play. Now, let's think about this. This is where another gray area occurs. I'm thinking of this sentence. If you know the whole story, then you could argue we know which geese we're talking about, and this is additional information. So if all of a sudden we say, you know, I could make this sentence and simply say, I felt bad for the geese. And why did you feel bad for them? If you feel that you're adding information, you could argue um, it's, it's not identifying information. I felt bad for the geese. 
who, lo who look tormented by the child's play. So you see there are gray areas sometimes um, in, in forming these adjective clauses. It can depend on someone's viewpoint, whether it's identifying or additional. Sometimes it's very clear, but other times I'd argue it's not. I felt bad for the geese. But I'd say again, in the context of this story, you know which geese I'm talking about. It's the geese in the park, the geese in this picture, the geese in my story. Um, and you could even add a word to make it more appropriate to see this as additional information, just like a, in a comment, an additional comment. I felt bad for the geese, who truly look tormented by the child's play. Okay? All right. All right, now we're going to reduce. I'm going to show you what happens. Do we take words out? Yes, we can, but only in certain situations. Um, in this first one, the geese that I saw were likely two or three different families. I realized as the boy started chasing them, um, the geese that previously had been moving around as a big group started splitting up. It was like everyone trying to survive, everyone running for shelter. Um, so some babies would go with one big mom goose, I, I assume it's a mother goose, and other babies would um, run to another mother goose and they'd all be following um, the moms. So I identified two or three groups. So I think there were two or three different families. Look at this, the geese that I saw. So the geese, this is the adjective clause inside the larger sentence. We're basically saying the geese were likely two or three different families. And I'm going to remind you which geese I'm talking about, the geese that I saw. Now inside this clause, I have the subject, verb, and object. If it's the object, I could take this out. It's an object in an identifying clause, so I can drop it. The geese I saw were likely two or three different families. Again, this is identifying and necessary. This is an object pronoun, and I can take it out. No, she wasn't awful. I mean, it was, it was sweet. She took her kid to the park, and that's beautiful. They're spending time in the outdoors, and he was giggling with delight, and she was watching him with love. And so it was all beautiful from that viewpoint that um, as I watched the geese, because I had been watching the geese for some time, and they looked so peaceful and so happy. And um, I, I was just worried about the baby goose, and maybe they were... Um, terrified <laughs> by these humans running after them and I just wanted to say okay you've had your fun please let them alone now let them go back to just walking at a um, relaxed pace please don't make them run for their lives <laughs> okay I don't like games or jokes that are based on scaring others again what could I say I don't like games or jokes well, not all of them, just some of them. Which ones? I need this information to identify which ones I don't like. That's why there's no comma. Now, here we go again. This time, this is a subject, but I also have a verb to be. If you see a verb or a form of the verb to be, you can usually take it out along with the pronoun, and what you'll be left with is often a past or present participle. This is ED, it's passive in nature, so what I'm really saying is I don't like games or jokes based on scaring others, right? Based on. I got rid of the pronoun and the form of be, and what I'm left with is a past participle. Okay, so you can take out the relative pronoun and a form of be and check to see what you're left with. You could be left with a past participle, a present participle. Sometimes you're left with a noun phrase. Okay, and the last one. <laughs> the child who chased the geese was about four years old. The child in my story was about four years old. Which child? The child who chased the geese. I'm identifying to make sure you know which child I'm talking about. 
This is identifying. Now I don't have a form of B. What could I do? I could take this out, but then I have to change this. Who knows what ending I need? Yes, my hippo, look at you. <laughs> and stunning lad agrees. The child chasing the geese was about four years old. I can do this. I don't have a form of be, but I can take this verb. It's active, chasing. Um, and I change it to a present participle, ing. The child chasing the geese. The child doing something. Which doing what? Chasing the geese. So there are these are three possible ways you could reduce a relative clause and I'll give my members a little bit more practice in the follow-up task okay super good guys how are you feeling about adjective clauses okay last task we're gonna start and I might have my members finished on the community tab so if you'd like to get the full practice consider again um, joining as a member and you'll get the practice task after this live stream um, again I'll remind you there is a full playlist on adjective clauses and you can review how to form them how to reduce them um, through those videos the final exercise I'm sharing with you is based on What's happening tomorrow? My son is graduating. So what I've done here is I've written a very short text um, and I'd like to rewrite it by putting some of the sentences together, okay? We're gonna put some of the sentences together by forming relative clauses, adjective clauses. So let me see if I can get this set up so that my video is not blocking any of the answers. I think we should be good to go, yes? Let me go down just a little more. Okay. All right, I'm going to read the text as is. I don't think um, there will be new vocabulary, but if there are any new words that you're not sure about, please let me know and I'll explain. Um, and then we'll start to make some changes together, but um, I'll have this task be something that members can finish on the community tab. Okay, let me take a sip of tea. The day is finally here. My son will graduate from high school tomorrow. He's 18 now, by the way. The commencement ceremony will be held inside the school auditorium. This is the alternate location. It was supposed to take place outside, but the forecast calls for rain. Regardless, it will be a special and important event. It's exciting to put on one's cap and gown. Each graduate goes on stage to receive a handshake and a diploma. High school graduation is a memorable day. On this day, a young person fully steps away from childhood and starts their journey as an adult. <laughs> How many of you remember your graduation day? Do you remember? Maybe you wore a cap and gown or maybe you didn't, but I'm sure you remember getting that diploma and knowing that you were done. <laughs> 12, 13 years of schooling was done. Okay, thank you, my hippo. You put your kids through high school and now into college, you understand. <laughs> okay, so we'll do the first paragraph together. The day is finally here. My son will graduate from high school tomorrow. He's 18 now, by the way. By the way is a hint. I'm adding information. I don't really need to add this detail, but I chose to. If I truly want to include this, but it's not necessary, I can do that with the help of an adjective clause. If I'm talking about my son, the adjective clause needs to go close to the head noun, the thing or person that I'm modifying. So I'm going to take this information and put it after my son. This is where I can put an adjective clause. We're talking about a person, so what relative pronoun do we need? Again, it's additional. I don't need this. My commas up here are like, by the way. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Oh, 
Oh, thank you, stunning lad one. <laughs> I appreciate that. Ooh, 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 yep, we'll be saying that tomorrow after he gets his diploma. <laughs> okay, again, if I'm using son, I'm going to change this pronoun to a relative pronoun. Mm hmm. Who? Just like I used a contraction here, I can use the contraction again up here. And I'll take this out. The day is finally here. My son, who is 18 now, will graduate from high school tomorrow. The commencement ceremony will be held inside the school auditorium. This is the alternate location. It's fine as is, but I have a choice to combine this. When I talk about the school auditorium, it's the same thing here. This is referring to the auditorium. I don't really need to tell you this, but I am. Not very necessary, but I'm going to. I do not use this as a relative pronoun. I have to use another relative pronoun for auditorium. Um, you know what? If you wanted to, I would either do my son who's 18 now, or I'd say my son now 18. So there's two options because I could drop this who is but I think now goes better before. So I'd either say, my son, who's 18 now, will graduate from high school tomorrow. My son, now 18, will graduate from high school tomorrow. So yes, I, I see two possibilities. Okay, let me put them in bold. Yes, I'm gonna use which. Remember, we do not use comma that, we do comma which. Now here's another possibility. Do you see I have a form of B? I could technically take this out. And what am I left with? Not a present or past participle, but with a noun or noun phrase. I could say the commencement ceremony will be held inside the school auditorium, the alternate location. It's possible. But for now, I'll leave, which is the alternate location. It was supposed to take place outside, but the forecast calls for rain. Regardless, it will be a special and important event. Okay, I am going to stop here because I'm going to let the next paragraph be part of the tasks. I usually do a group of tasks um, as follow-up practice for my members. So in any case, um, there will be a way to gain further practice by joining as a member and visiting the community tab. Okay, so let me pull away from that and just ask you if you have any other questions. Um, I will be putting follow-up tasks on the community tab. Uh, it'll take me just a little bit of time to create them for you. If you have other questions, if they're short questions, I'll answer. But remember, every month, members, I invite you to send in questions. When I um, make the invitation, post your requests or your questions um, in the comments for that member-only post, and I'll address them, OK? Um, I want to thank all my members, though. Thank you, thank you um, to the ones especially who are here, but to all the ones who have signed up, thank you. And I also have some kind-hearted patrons on Patreon who make donations every month, and I thank you as well. Um, actually, I haven't had a chance to thank the one person um, in a video yet, but Kathy is one of my new patrons. She just signed up. Um, she's donating $2 a month, so Kathy, thank you very much for being a kind-hearted patron. Okay. Um, also, as usual, guys, I hope you know that if you're curious about my 15 years, 15 plus years now on YouTube, I do have a short book that I've shared on Amazon. Um, it's written in a very conversational style. If you're high intermediate to advanced, it's very accessible. So if you're curious to know what it's been like for me um, 15 years on YouTube, you can hear my story or read my story um, on 
Amazon. Okay. All right. So let's end there. I'm going to jump over to my main screen and check for any final questions. So we focused primarily on adjective clauses because that was the main question that I received. Um, in July, we'll have our next monthly live stream and I'll be curious to know what questions get submitted. Okay, thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope this was useful. Please check out the shorts. Um, there's a collection of them. They all go together and they all review those ever words, whatever, however, whenever, etc. Okay, so there's um, actually two topics we covered today those words and then adjective clauses. All right, um, which is the new edition? Yes, um, there's a, a, the second edition of the book was uploaded to correct. Oh, there was a couple of typos, but they've been fixed. <laughs> How do you use the sentence? I'm fluttered, fluttered, flattered, flattered. We hear more often fluttering. Um, I think of butterflies that fluttered, I guess, in that context. It's not a way I describe my feeling very often. But fluttered might suggest nervousness because fluttering is very quick movement like you can feel like there's a fluttering inside uh, but normally we'd say something like the jitters have you heard of that I put that in the chat the jitters um, if, if you're nervous you feel like the jitters and you feel um, not quite stable not quite calm if you have the Oh, flustered? Yeah, I'm wondering if flustered. That's a good possibility. Flustered is just you're, you're um, not quite certain how to react. I can use it when I accept it. I'm happy to hear that. Right, uh, Mahipo, can you confirm, did you mean f um, flustered, which would be more common? Um, but again, I wouldn't really identify that as conversational English. Right, let's. Mm -hmm. Somebody can become flustered and um, they're somewhat upset and nervous at the same time. And somebody who's flustered would be at a loss of words, for example. Um, it's a situation that knocks them off balance, so to speak. Um, I'm looking in Merriam Webster. Um, like someone became so flustered that she kept repeating herself, right? Some people get nervous during public speaking. Um, they're so flustered, they become a little lost. Their thoughts become scattered and they're not able to focus. So they're a little confused, but it's because of nervousness, right? A flustered person. I wouldn't identify that as conversational English though. Okay. Flattered is completely different. Flattered is when um, something is considered an honor. Um, somebody compliments you or praises you or gives you some sort of special honor and you're very flattered. Maybe flattered by an invitation. If someone invites you to speak and you're like, wow, you're inviting me to speak. I didn't know I was that special. I'm very flattered by the invitation. All right? Something flattered, you're grateful and it makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, now you learn two words, flattered and flustered. <laughs> what you can do, Mahippo, is when I post the follow-up tasks, um, if you want to create your own example sentence, I'll be happy to correct it. Okay? All right, guys, winding down. We're 10 minutes past the hour, so thank you for joining me, and have a beautiful evening, afternoon, or day, wherever you are. Thank you, guys, and I wish you happy studies. Bye!